Good morning, everyone. Welcome to First Memorial Presbyterian Church. Um, please join me in the call to worship. With our eyes fixed on Jesus, we have been given example after example of supernatural interruptions and divine interventions amidst our, our expected routines of life. As we worship our omnipotent God this hour, may we find more evidence and inspiration expressing his divine love. Thank you, Megan. Um, we are skipping the praise song, not singing that verbally. Rachel's not here to sing it. Loretta has a note from her mother that she doesn't have to sing it. That's why she played such a beautiful version of it for the prelude, and I thank her for that, because that was a lovely selection. We're proceeding on to the call to confession. For those of you following, Jesus promised us that God is kind, even, in the, even to the ungrateful and the wicked. Even to us, God is kind. Trusting in God's kindness and love, let us confess our sin. Let us pray together. Merciful God, we confess that we have not followed your ways or trusted your promises. We love only those who love us. We show kindness only to those who are kind to us. We give only when we expect to receive. Forgive us, Lord. Fill our hearts with your selfless love. Change our lives by your matchless grace. These things we pray through Christ our Savior. Amen. Children of the Most High God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, we have received grace in good measure, spilling out and running over. John preached a gospel of repentance to prepare the way for one who would baptize with the Holy Spirit. Jesus received John's baptism in preparation for giving us a peace which passes all understanding. We are blessed to be called upon to bring such a blessing to others. In word and in deed, let us proclaim God's peace to stressed, troubled, and broken hearts wherever they may be. Please share a warm greeting and a sincere sign of God's peace with someone you call or meet this week. Okay, good morning again, everyone. So, how many kids out there have heard their parents say, I'll believe it when I see it? Like maybe you say, I'm going to clean my room or I'm going to clean our playroom. And the parents say, I'll believe it when I see it. And then you actually do it and they say, it's a miracle, right? I know in our house, I believe that's a miracle. But is it really a miracle? No, right? Jesus performed miracles. He raised people from the dead. He helped the blind see. He cured lepers. Those are miracles. Cleaning your bedroom, probably not a miracle. But in today's lesson, we're going to hear about Thomas. And if you've ever heard of doubting Thomas, this is where it comes from. So the disciples come back and they say, we've seen Jesus. And Jesus had already died. And Thomas said, no, I really need to see it for myself. I need to see the wounds that he has. 
I need to see it for myself. So kind of like when your parents say, I'll believe it when I see it. So guess what happens? Jesus shows up to Thomas and Thomas gets to see all his wounds from when he died and guess what happens? Thomas believes. Kind of like after you do it, your parents, ah, believe. So, miracle, not so much cleaning your room, but Jesus performed miracles, right? Showing up to Thomas was a miracle. So, let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for showing us miracles and helping us to believe, even if we can't see it. Amen. Today's lesson is taken from the Gospel according to John, chapter 20, verses 24 through 31. For maximum understanding, please follow along in your own Bible. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. But Thomas, who was called the twin, was one of twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the, the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand at his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God, Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which were not written in this book. But these were, are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Another sermon it is not necessary for me to give because Megan has already given it. Ably, wisely, simply. More than meets the eye. I'm looking at John chapter 20, verse 31, but the miracles John wrote about were written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. And that through believing that he is, you may have life in his name. Believing that Jesus is the Messiah, 
gives you the opportunity to have life and to live life in his name. If I were to say to you, where are you all from? You would probably make an assumption about where I was from. The South, right? My eldest son moved to South Carolina in September and came home for Thanksgiving. And boy, could he say y'all like he'd been born and raised in the South. He had assimilated the, the cadence, the, the diphthong, um, the, the, the intonation of the vowel. He had it down. Southerners, eat your hearts out. Marshall, who was born and raised in Monmouth County, New Jersey, could talk like you. Where are you all from? Even if you've never, ever been there, people might guess that you all were from Missouri when you react to things that you don't believe to be possible or credible. And you say something to them like, show me. Now that, to my surprise, according to Google, is not the official state motto of Missouri. They do put it on the license plate. Somebody does. And on those signs on the interstate as you cross the state line coming into town. But that's not it. In fact, it's not necessarily flattering. When there was a miners' strike up north in the silver country, and the poor and unemployed from Missouri rushed to the aid to get some money to put food on their table, rushed to the aid of those poor, troubled mine owners who were underpaying and not protecting the health and welfare of their employees. They showed up in numbers, great numbers, and they began to work the mines. And for every technique and every operation and every step of mining that silver, they would have to turn to the foreman who was screaming at them and say, I don't know how to do that. Show me. And that's as likely an explanation of where the phrase show me state came from as any of the other possible explanations for where it came from. But when they began to be called that, scabs that they were to the industrial business of life in that particular part of our history, the foreman would look to each other and say, show me. Those guys from Missouri, show me. And so it wasn't entirely flattering. Today we use it and we mean it as if to say those folks are thinking people and they require evidence. They require proof. They require convincing. They're not going to swallow whatever you say hook, line, and sinker. You've got to show them. Now that is a whole lot more flattering than the guys who didn't know how to get the silver out of the mine. So, I think it's better to look at it in the most positive light. The next time a Missouri car passes you on I-80 and then pulls in front and slows down. And instead of thinking all the things I know you all think when that happens, it's really the Pennsylvania people that do that, isn't it? No, right? Just, I'm not even going to go there. I'm just playing a little fun here. But you and I also don't want to swallow anything whole that doesn't make sense to us. We want to be shown. We want to be convinced. We want it explained. We want it demonstrated. We're intelligent people. 
Massachusetts may argue with us, but there are statistics that would lend us to believe that New Jersey is the most educated population in the country. Did you know that? Well, somebody tried to sell it to me, and I did not say, show me. I said, oh, I like the sound of that. I live with smart guys and gals, for those who take those two words literally. John 20, verse 31, but the miracles John wrote about were written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing that he is the Messiah, the Son of God, you may have life in his name. You may live to the fullest in his name. You may be blessed. Haven't our life experiences determined what we are willing to believe or not swallow? Haven't your life experiences taught you that there is no free lunch unless it's from a relative? Not when I was young enough to be in school, but today there are also free lunches at school for those whose families are in difficult straits financially. But typically speaking, there is no free lunch unless you show up on Wednesdays in Lent at First Memorial Presbyterian Church. And I'm not even sure that we can work that out yet. We're still trying to figure that one out. And haven't we all learned from the school of hard knocks or the warnings of our mothers and fathers do not trust someone who promises us something for nothing. That goes right along with there's no free lunch. Before we had caller ID on our cell phones and we answered every call that came in, which we don't do now. You don't know that number or you don't know that name. You don't take the call. And if you do, you shouldn't. But I'm not here to talk about that. I don't. I don't let strangers into my house. I don't let strangers in through my phone. And I love it when that little spam meter, you know, comes on the screen and <laughs> you see the little arrow come around like a second hand. You have to be careful not to be taken because We've all been taken, and it is painful, and it is sometimes costly, and it is often embarrassing, even if you're the only one who knows you were taken. You're embarrassed in front of yourself. You should have known better. Who planted that seed? Should have known better. So I guess it shouldn't be a surprise when our high school or college students come home from school saying or acting like they don't believe there is a God, right? There are no miracles like the Bible teaches. According to what their teachers tell them and according to what their textbooks tell them, and their textbooks aren't allowed to tell them anything other than that, we created that own mess ourselves or stood by silently and let it happen. But after being exposed to teachers and textbooks, our kids, by the time they're in their 20s, think the faith that you and I were raised with is ridiculous. Why do they think that? Hmm. Maybe because they've never seen anybody turn water into wine. My favorite miracle Jesus first, that's an Irish attempt at humor. It's not my favorite. Never seen a crippled person pick up his pallet and walk on command? Have you? What if somebody walked in right now with friends on either side of them, enabling them to come down the aisle while a third person in the back is dragging the pallet? And they set it down on the floor, and I go over and I lay hands on them, put a little um, 
holy oil on them and make the sign of the cross on their forehead. Presbyterians can do that, you know. And then stand back and say, take up your pallet and go home. And they walk out of here unassisted. We only have one defibrillator in the building. Most of you would be in trouble if you saw that happen. Because with your own eyes seeing it, you wouldn't believe it. Never had that experience before. There's no repetitious expression and experience to guide us into thinking that's what's supposed to happen. And I wouldn't be surprised, knowing how much you trust me, if you didn't think that was a plant. It was an act. I staged that. You still wouldn't believe it if you saw it with your own eyes. That darn Reverend Schaefer, what is he up to? Our kids have never seen somebody recover their vision after someone rubs mud in their eyes. Our kids have never seen somebody's mottled, uh, disturbing-looking skin cleared of leprosy because they touch Jesus' robe, or even acne. Heck, Clearasil can't even clear acne. Well, who knows? I think you outgrow it faster than Clearasil cures it. But that was my own personal experience. But just after being touched, or touching the robe of the Son of God? Ever seen that? Ever come to expect that's what's going to happen? So much of Jesus' ministry and Jesus' teachings and preachings are interlaced with miracles. If you heard or saw that he was moving into your town for the afternoon and you grabbed something to eat to keep you going and maybe a, a little jug of water and headed off with the crowd to follow him to the hillside or the lakeside, you knew you were going to hear inspiring words, uplifting words, helpful explanations about the mysteries of faith I'm going to come back to mysteries of faith in a moment. And with that intellectual wisdom, that stimulation of the mind and the heart about the truth about God, you were also expecting, because of the way he has performed in every other town where he has visited, in every other temple where he has spoken, people were healed of their infirmities. And you were expecting to see that again. You might have dragged your brother, or your mother, or your neighbor, or your son, in the hopes that that person that mattered to you would be blessed with healing. Because that's what Jesus does. That's what Jesus has been doing for three years. That's what Jesus does over and over and over again. So that if it doesn't happen, you're sitting there thinking, what's wrong with today? What's wrong with these people? Why isn't Jesus being Jesus? and doing what he's done everywhere else. Jesus even heals non-Jews. And the Jews were not known for their friendliness with non-Jews in those days. Presbyterians were not the first chosen frozen. So much of Jesus' ministry is interlaced with healing that it, it is a component part 
Sure, for those of us who grew up in households where the parents actually taught that they believed in Jesus' miracles, resulting in us, their children, wanting to believe ourselves that Jesus' miracles are true. We need only rationalize how each one might be. Hmm. Well, creating the earth in seven days. Let's see. Well, God's time is not exactly our time. So maybe seven human days are not seven godly days. Good. We've rationalized that one away. Let's move on to the next. But we want to believe. We may not believe. We may just lock that part out of our thought process because we can't make it work with our little brains. But we want to believe. But in households where parents were silent on the subject of Jesus' miracles being true, why would anybody want to believe that? Why would anybody want to dare to trust that those magic tricks were real? Why have the desire to be a believer when other people in authority that are rising to your attention in high school and college and beyond are saying, that's ridiculous. That's, that's not possible. That just doesn't happen. That's made up. Well, just so I don't get fired today, let's take parents out of the faith equation. But you all do play a role. You all do play a role. I said that pretty good, didn't I? Parents get blamed enough, and our kids will be in therapy long enough because of it, that, you know, we don't have to deal with this one as their responsibility. But have you ever wondered why crowds of people in the thousands followed Jesus around to hear what he had to say and see what he could do? Why did those crowds continue to grow larger and larger if he wasn't actually doing it? They wouldn't be following a fake. They wouldn't be delivering, they wouldn't be following and, and anxious to see and hear someone who couldn't deliver on his reputation that he performed miracles. Why, even the chief priests and the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees who wanted him dead were silent on the subject of Jesus being able to heal. Of all the things they stood in front of him and accused him of doing and not doing, of all the blasphemies that they laid on him, they never once said a recorded word on whether Jesus couldn't heal. You think they would have let that slide by? You think that wouldn't have been ammunition to bring him down in his popularity? <sighs> well, on vacation one summer in Sturbridge, Massachusetts, uh, some friends and I stopped, as we always did when we went there, uh, and stayed overnight above the Sturbridge Inn on a hill. And that particular night that we were there, this particular year, they had entertainment. They had entertainment every night, but they, they, their entertainment was a magician. And they had all been there before. I was the newbie. They had all been there before, and they said, Alan, we're going to have the time of our lives tonight. We're going to go see this really great musician. You're going to love this. I may be Irish, but I'm also German. Don't blow smoke up my skirt. I, I, magic is just sleight of hand and hocus pocus and distraction and all the rest of that. I still think that. But here I was, not wanting to be the only one who stayed behind his room and watched an old movie on the cable channel. So I went along 
And wouldn't you know it, they dragged me to the first front row and sat me in the middle, right in front of the performer. And when he pulled his first stunt, I scowled. And when he pulled his second stunt, I scoffed and probably said something to one of the guys on either side of me to express my disbelief. This is all hooey. What intelligent person from New Jersey is going to believe this crap? And they, on either side, I could see they were grinning and they were, the grins were getting bigger and bigger. And finally, um, without boldly heckling him at full volume in front of everybody, the magician calls me up and says, come here, young man. I want you to help me prove to everybody that what I'm doing is magic. And he made a fool out of me. I could not see his sleight of hand. I could not figure out his technique. I could not comprehend how he was pulling this off. And now there's a room full of several hundred people who are grinning at me like I'm an idiot. So ashamed and embarrassed and not being able to dig out of a hole that I had dug myself, I went back to my seat. And he grinned, the performer, for the rest of the show. And I didn't speak to my friends for the rest of the night. Those dirty dogs. Would you... Would you... Jesus is never recorded as embarrassing someone because they doubted he could do what he set out and set forth to do. No one ever heckled him or scowled at him. For if he had no rebuttal because they'd even seen for themselves or, or heard from a trusted source, he delivered time after time, afternoon and night after afternoon and night, whether or not they had enough to feed them or Jesus fed them with five loaves and or three fishes and five barley loaves or whatever it was. That's not enough to make me stop being hungry. Come on, guys. Where do we get off thinking Jesus didn't actually do this stuff? Because you don't think he does it anymore? Well, now, are you sure about that? You sure Jesus doesn't still perform miracles? If you've known me any length of time, you've heard me say sooner or later that faith is not bubble wrap. It does not protect us from the pain and suffering of the falls of life and the bumps and the bruises of life. We all have them. We're not safe from them because we believe Jesus is our Lord and Savior and the Son of God and the Messiah promised. Faith is not bubble wrap for protection against painful things. Miracles are evidence of Christ's power, not ours. That's one of your take-homes for today. Write it down. Not one of you. Shame. This is big stuff I'm giving you right now. Miracles are evidence of Christ's power, not ours. And it's not evidence of our, our, our power to control Christ demonstrating or not, his power to heal. Christ doesn't perform on demand. You remember teaching your first pet how to sit on command? Christ doesn't sit. He doesn't fetch. He doesn't heal. Jesus is not your pet. 
And if he were, what kind of Jesus would he be? Would you really want him as your Lord and Savior? Maybe if you're so full of yourself, you think you're entitled to that, you would, but I would hope you wouldn't. Miracles are evidence of Christ's power, not ours. He hasn't completely stopped. He's not visibly walking on earth with us and gathering crowds around him on a daily basis and teaching and preaching and healing as part of what he does to give more evidence. We should have enough evidence from Scripture. We should have enough unchallenged evidence from Scripture. There's a phrase in John towards the end that says, John wrote this book so that you might know of his works and his healing powers and believe. There's a reason for that. And he also goes on to say, if they were all recorded, there aren't enough books in existence to contain all the stories, to tell all the truths, to convey all the evidence. There aren't enough books. Jesus' healing power was not a rare or occasional or a special day thing, or like some televangelists might want you to believe, because you have enough faith. I have yet to serve a church that doesn't have its own set of stories, its own evidence from within the congregation that should be known to the rest of the congregation of the power of Jesus to heal in demonstration of God's love and compassion as evidence of God being the greatest physician. I don't remember how many weeks it was, but it wasn't many. After my arrival and after Charles came back to worship, dragged here by his faithful, loving wife, who said, you got to hear this guy. What was she thinking? You don't remember that, Irene? So one of my first actual face-to-face -face encounters with the only man I know who prayed longer than I did Mr. Yearwood, Elder Yearwood, Moderator Yearwood, State of Clerk of Session Yearwood, Super Christian Yearwood, has a daughter about to give premature birth, three months so. She's sitting in the room right now. Did I get clearance to say your name? Kim. Kim had twins coming. A little sooner than planned. I don't know if the nursery was painted yet. I don't know if the cribs were put together yet. I don't know what the situation was. But they were evidently on their way. And Michelle was born and she had a, a defect, a, a problem. I'm, I'm not, I'm not, uh, it's not me to, to, to explain to you what the thing was medically because you wouldn't understand it anyway. You're not physicians. But she had something that didn't look promising for a long life. So Kim calls her dad and says, I need prayer. Her dad calls his mother, says, we need prayer. His mother calls God and says, I want you, I want you, Lord, to amaze the physicians. I want them to be astounded. I want them to be speechless. Implied, implied, not literal. 
I want this to be a witness to them of your power. Implied, not literally spoken. You know what? I have yet to walk in the door of the Randolph Diner and not see the evidence of that miracle standing there by the cash register. I don't go there that often, but I have yet to go there without seeing Michelle there. 24 years later? This is not just Michelle's miracle. This is not just Charles's miracle. This is not just Irene's miracle or Tim's miracle or her grandmother's miracle. This is the family of faith's miracle. You should all know this story if you don't remember it. Why not? This is profound stuff. This is God at his best. So that you need not doubt that he loves you enough and has the power. He doesn't always have the reason. You know, I've, I've found myself, and God does this to me. He sets me up. He did this once with, uh, with Robert Schuller because I was tired of standing at the door of a great church and shaking hands with people who just had a fantastic worship service and terrific, inspiring music and an uplifting sermon, but they were in a hurry to get out the door to go home to watch the Hour of Power for this TV bozo. I, that, that's a story I used to tell, and God whipped me. <laughs> he really did a job on me. He managed to manipulate me to be out there. I went five years in a row, ultimately, to, the, um, to, to, to a training school that Dr. Schuler ran, from which I learned much, and from which I ate much crow about what I had thought of him prior to. My latest thing that God is working on me on is uh, I, I've been telling stories to, to friends about, um, you know, how, how I remember being told, particularly by our neighbor from across the street in Livingston growing up, you know, that um, when we would talk about our faith and the, the differences between Roman Catholicism and Presbyterianism, um, you know, we'd ask the big questions and um, she would say, well, uh, sister said that's a sacred mystery. What? That's a sacred mystery. We can't understand it. We can't explain it. We can't grasp it. It is beyond us. And what a great line to come back with when you don't know the answer to something. It's a sacred mystery. Who can argue with that? Besides people from Missouri. Who can argue with that? And yet, as my life continues to unfold and the complications of life are compounded for those I care about and love and who run into difficult times and, oh, if only there were spiritual bubble wrap. There isn't. But there are things, I know, I never argued that. There are things, uh, my tiny little mind just can't get its intellect wrapped around. If God stood here and explained it to me, I might as well be in a senior honors medical class in medical school for how high the answer would fly over my head and I would be dizzy and confused as I was before. What makes us think that we are as smart as or smarter than God that we could grasp everything that is in play when he is making a decision about how to answer the prayer? And there isn't anybody he doesn't want to heal. There isn't anybody he doesn't want to save. But sometimes, you know, the body just can't go on. Is there anything God can't do? Uh, is there any stone made so heavy that God can't lift it? 
give me a break. This doesn't mean I can grasp the why or the how. How did he do that? That's what I was doing with that clown of a magician. How did he do that? It's fake. It's a trick. It's a blur of hand. I don't know why we call it sleight of hand. It's a blur of hand. <laughs> he distracts us over here and moves his hand so fast we don't see it, and then all of a sudden, there's the quarter. It's behind my ear the whole time. I don't think so. You, if you will be sincere and, and, and focused and sit down with good intentions, probably no other miracles of healing that God has performed through Jesus in answer to prayer in this congregation. I don't know all your stories. I'm starting to get a complex because I'm starting to think that some of you are afraid of me. I don't bite. I don't have the teeth for it. It's gross or I would pull down my lower lip and show you there isn't a tooth here. I took them out one night and I don't know what I did with them. And my dentist, Dr. Kab um, yeah, whatever his name is, is uh, making me a new set. In the meantime, I eat a lot of tuna fish and uh, drink a lot of uh, fruit juice. What else can I do? Poor Alan. Come on, at least one of you. Give me a little sympathy here. Thank you. God bless you. You are going to get a good seat in heaven. Yes. Folks, there isn't one of Jesus' miracles I don't have reason to believe because of all the others that I know about. All the churches that I've served where people came up to me and told me, or when I was at the hospital, and I go to see the patient who is practically ready for hospice care, or was in hospice care. And then they say to me, guess what happened today? The doctor came in and said, the scan we took this morning is perfectly clear. It's like you never had this. And I, I have no explanation for it. It's not a result of my medicine practice. It's a higher power. And there was no fragrance of alcohol on the doctor's breath. Come on, people. How much evidence do you need? It's all around us. Someday, tell me a story about this miracle business in this congregation that I don't already know. You don't have to pray as long as Alan or moderator Yearwood or anybody else for that matter. You don't have to have more faith than we have. I just put myself in Charles' class. Is that allowed? You don't have to have more faith than we have. And don't ever accept from somebody the fact that if your prayer isn't being answered the way you want it to, it's because you don't have enough faith. Bring that slob around and let me have a go at him. That's re that is so unlike any way God works. There's no evidence of that attitude from him in Scripture anywhere. But if you didn't implant in your children a reason to believe that their experience of life is not the last word on whether God can perform miracles or not, and that you do indeed believe yourselves that he does, Where are they going to get it? 
an eloquent preacher? Not this guy. All I can tell you is what I've seen and what I've been told from people I have every reason to believe and the profoundly consistent evidence of Scripture. Unchallenged evidence, even from Jesus' most hateful enemies. How could these stories not be true? How could we not believe? Everyone else's story, whether it's from this congregation or some other, is also our miracle. And we need to claim those miracles when we hear those stories, and we need to thank God for those miracles when we hear those stories, and we need to hold on to them even when Jesus isn't working out quite like the Sears wish book, giving us exactly what we wanted in size and color and features and guarantees. I used to be a Sears man. Sears, good, better, best. You remember the progression of the quality of goods in the catalog? No, you didn't pay attention. Thank you, Jesus, for Michelle, who gave us reason to believe and still gives us reason to believe about your omnipotence and about your concern, unmatched concern for our well-being. We say, thank you, Jesus. Amen. Kim, thanks for letting me share that story. I'm sure you could have told it better and probably should have had you up here to do it. You're enough like your dad. You could have stood here for an hour and told that story. Don't give me that. Right, Irene? Children of the Most High God, in obedience to Jesus' words, to love others as we love ourselves, to do good, bless and pray for friends and enemies alike, let us now do to others as we would have them do to us. Let us now offer our tithes and offerings for the sake of our sisters and brothers in need of grace and grain and evidence of God's love. And as those present in our sanctuary prepare to give here, and now, may you who are not here and now consider mailing your offering to us at 51 West Blackwell Street, 07801.
Let us pray together. Holy God, you have given us land in which to grow and thrive, food for survival and pleasure, air and water, fire and cold. Make our thanksgiving bloom forth into the lives of others. In the name of the one who gave everything for us. Amen. Okay, joys and concerns. Um, prayers for teachers and students. They have 100 days of school down and only 80 something more to go. So prayers for a smooth second half of the year. Uh, let's pray for the Ukraine and the world as Russia is trying to ex exude their doom and dominance over the world. Uh, pray all for, who are sick, have a speedy recovery. Uh, we want to pray for all the healthcare workers and first responders and everyone affected by the pandemic. Hopefully we are on the other side of it, if not now, soon. Um, we have birthdays. Clara wants to say happy birthday to her grandson, Anthony. Uh, and our other birthdays are Nishabi Beeler, Eloise Altoff, and Walter Forrester III, and Betty McNaughton. And, oh, sorry, real quick, um, just three quick announcements. The Super Bowl of Caring. We raised over $500 and collected 163 cans, jars, and boxes of food. So thank you to everybody who donated. Um, if you didn't get it in during the Super Bowl of Caring, we're accepting donations all year round. So please drop them off down here at church or let me know and I can come pick them up from you. Um, we are having our second cookie fundraiser. This time it will be either lemon or chocolate chip cookies. We're asking people to order by February 27th, and the pickup will be March 5th from 12 to 2 p.m. There's an order form on our website, or you can reach out to myself or the Facebook page, uh, the Presbyterian Church Facebook page. And there is new Our Daily Bread devotionals in the back of the church. If you'd like one and can't get here to church, let us know, and we can get one to you in the mail. Now, our individual prayers for the week are for Alexa, Alice, Angel, Andrew, Anne, Artie, Barbara, Benjamin, Bruce, Brian, Catherine, Christine, Claudette, Darlene, David, Debbie, Diana, Dick, Dominic, Donna, Dawn, Annie, Eddie, Ellen, Florence, Gary, Gina, George, Helen, Irene, Jay, Janet, Jonathan, Jody, Joanne, John, Jasper, Joe, Karen, Ken, Kim, Keith, Kathy, Larry, Linda, Lynn, Lily, Morgan, Nancy, Nishabi, Nora, Owen, Peter, Pat, Paulette, Paul, Rick, Scott, Sarah, Stephen, Taryn, Ted, Terry, Thelma, Tony, Tracy, Walter, Wayne, Riona, and John. 
Thank you, Magan. We believe, so we pray. We thank you, O God, for the friends and family with whom we share life and love, joy and sorrow, for the friends and family with whom we join hands and hearts in the writing and the telling of the stories of our lives and your miracles amongst us, with whom we share from the abundance of our talents and treasures, the bounty of our tables and cupboards, the thrill of our games and sports, and the hope of peace and prosperity, especially as peace appears less and less likely in the international politics of today. We thank you, O God, for the faith we share. The gospel we have given us, you have given us, excuse me, to teach. The ministries you have called us to support. The prayers you have enabled us to offer on behalf of ourselves and each other. And especially the prayer Jesus taught us to pray when he said, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now I charge you to go and tell the good news. The Lord of life and light is with us. Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. The very face of God shines upon you with beauty, blessing, and peace. Amen. Amen. Thought this broke.